Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day a daily bread. Forgive us, forgive us. As we forgive the ones who sin against us, forgive them and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let your kingdom come. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Holy, holy. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day a daily bread. Forgive us, forgive us. As we forgive the ones who sin against us. Forgive them. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let your kingdom come. It's yours. It's yours. All yours. All yours. The kingdom. The power. The glory is yours. It's yours. It's yours. It's yours. All yours. All yours. Forever and ever. The kingdom is yours. Father, let your kingdom come. Holy, holy. Father, let your will be done. Let it be done. Earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Right here in my heart. Earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Wake up, church. Good morning. There's revival and it's spreading like a wildfire in my heart. Sunday morning, hallelujah, and it's lasting all week long. Can you hear it? Can you feel it? It's the rhythm of a gospel song. Oh, once you choose it, you can't lose it. Oh, cause there ain't nothing, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. I got an old church by a singing in my soul. I got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful. I got a heart overflowing cause I've been restored. Turn to mountains that I can't climb. Oh, you're with me. Never leave me. Oh, cause there ain't nothing, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. I got an old church by a singing in my soul. I got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful. I got a heart overflowing because I've been restored. And there Steal my joy, no there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. Stop your 
be till you find that God will be just all you'll ever need. All you'll ever need. I've got an old church choir singing in my soul. I've got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful. i got an old church choir singing in my soul.
peace, bring it all to peace. The storm surrounded me, let it break. At your name, still call the sea to still, the rage of me to still. Every way at your name, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. Breathe, call these bones to live, call these lungs to sing once again. I will praise Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. You silence fear, Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. The name is a light that the shadows can't deny. Your name cannot be overcome. Your name is a light forever lifted high. my praise to you, Jesus, let everything that I do bring glory to you, you are the way and the truth, no one shall come to the Father, it's only through Jesus, oh what a price to pay, Jesus, 
Your sacrifice made the way, Jesus. Thank you for born again and the mercy that never ends. quickly about our resources we brought some books this morning this little book susan and i wrote i maybe told you about it before it doesn't matter i'm telling you again uh miracles on a frozen pond summer's coming up and some of you're going to have some of you gonna have a little more time to read this is a great book to share with your kids and all proceeds from this go to the hope haven uh in lindale we have a ministry there and uh we want to provide a good back to school party in August for those young ladies. Some of them are just coming into the home and trying to find their place there to, to be in a group home for that reason. And they need a lot of encouragement. And we try to, those of us that have been a part of that wanna want those young ladies to feel at home there. But I have a variety of Susan's uh, sermonettes by Susan. And uh, those are back there also, those are free. These here are just any kind of love offering, and it all goes toward uh, our outside ministries. These, this particular book is dedicated to the girls' home. But I don't want to make a commercial and dampen the spirit. I'm going to have to bring me a seatbelt to this church. You also have some things you do that, I'm not, that I used to be used to, uh, like testimony service and everything. But uh, I'm not used to that so much anymore. I appreciate y'all doing it, but I need a seatbelt during that time. Because from the time she got up to testify and this other brother, I knew I was in the right place, and I knew I had the right word. Amen. Last week, I felt very strongly that God wanted me to preach on restoration and to bring you something to, to help you get on the road to being restored. And y'all responded very well. But I want to bring you one this morning. This is fresh out of the oven. Now, whenever I was... Well, I'll, I'll talk about that a minute later. But a few days ago... Uh, I had this stupid dream, and this dream was about I wanted to get a, a detailed receipt for something that was done. I think it was work on the house or something, and I wanted a detailed receipt, and the guy said, I can't give you one. And I was, yes, I need a detailed receipt. And he said, no, we don't do that. I don't give detailed receipts. And I was upset about it, and I woke up mad. You know, our mind does not know the difference between fantasy and reality. When a dreams prove that. 
you can get mad in a dream and it didn't even happen. It wasn't even real. But you can get mad. It can affect your emotions. But I woke up and I was mad and I was trying to get over that and put it aside. And I started to pray myself back to sleep. And when I prayed back myself back to sleep, y'all ever done that? It's the best way. It beats the, it beats the sleeping pill. Just take the gospel. And I prayed myself back to sleep, and then the Lord awoke me with these words. Practice encouragement. And I heard, and some way or another, I guess maybe I just do that when... Uh, I'm preaching on a certain subject. It seems like every song and everybody, it's testimony, and everything I see somehow or another relates to or points to that particular sermon subject. And, you know, normally I have to get, back when I was a lead pastor, I'd have to sometimes get two to three sermons together a week. I didn't like preaching Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday, but sometimes I ended up doing it. So it's two to three sermons a week plus the other jail ministries and prison ministries that we do. And so now I'm a semi-retired pastor and on staff at the Church of Garden Valley with discipleship, prison ministries, jail ministries, and uh, senior center ministries, nursing homes and such, and and discipleship. And in that time, I spent a lot of time developing our materials and developing study courses and developing PowerPoints on certain subjects. But when I get a fresh sermon, I don't intend to just preach it once any more than Dallas Home would write a song and sing it one time and quit. (laughs) I I don't intend nowadays to just preach this sermon once and quit, but I will tell you this, this one's right out of the oven. This is the one the Lord gave me for the lighthouse in Bullard. Practice encouragement. You know, the Lord is beginning to give me sermons as, like they're special sermons that the church world as a whole needs to hear. And if there ever was a time that we need to hear encouragement, it's today. It's a day and hour we're living in. Now, some of us old heads... <laughs> I am 70 and a half years old. I know I don't look it. It's okay, folks. But I've already been through this. The same God that got me through Carter (laughs) is going to get me through the present. (laughs) We saw it one time when y'all talk about inflation. When gas went from 29 cents to $2 overnight, and minimum wage is $1.65, there was some real crisis things going on, especially when we were driving cars that got five miles to a gallon. <laughs> it was craziness everywhere you look, people's reaction to what was going on. But my God got me through the late 70s, and the Lord can get me through the early 2020s. My God is a God that can come on the scene in every situation. And what's happening in the world does not set the tone for me. What happens in my heart sets a tone for me. I prayed God this morning. When I first got this marriage message, it sounded kind of like something that wouldn't go very deep. But the more I studied it, and with what I've already heard here this morning... I prayed, God, let this thing go deep. Somebody needs to change their lifestyle because your lifestyle seems to fit what's going on in your life and your happenings. Are you with me? If things are happening good, you're feeling good, but when things start happening bad, you start getting discouraged. Listen, I cannot allow this world to be my source of encouragement because when I do that, I also allow this world to be my source of discouragement. And I can't afford that. I can't afford to let this world set the pace. God didn't put us here to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth for, the, for the, what's going on around us. If I let Washington, uh, if I let Capitol Hill, if I let 
people around me that are going nuts. If I let men that want to be women and women that want to be men change the way I feel, there's something wrong in my spirit. i got to go on anyway. I can't help all the confusions that's going on right now, and I can't afford to spend all my time thinking about it, worrying about it, hearing about it, and wondering what we're going to do about it. I know in whom I believe, and I believe in revival, and I believe in, in, those, in the fact that when the Lord moves in His way, I don't care what's going on. Transgender people can get saved and turn their lives around. Amen. And that's the only thing going to change it. Legislation is not going to change it. The world's not going to change it. Only God can change a heart. And so, I, if y'all all right with me, I'm about to get worked up up here. We trust our doctors that only have a license to practice. We trust lawyers that only have a license to practice. Can I tell you this morning, God has given His people a license to practice, and you've got to use it. You've got to decide if I'm going to practice the things of God. Because whenever the Holy Spirit came in you, whenever it came in you, He brought things into you that we've got to bring out and practice. Amen. It's not just when we feel like it, but we got to bring it out when we don't feel like it. Are you listening to me this morning? There's people in here that know what good preaching is, and it challenges me when I preach the Word of God that I want to talk to those that I, you've heard good preaching. You know what it is. You know what anointed preaching sounds like. Well, listen, can I tell you this morning, I pray that God will use him this morning and anoint me this morning to get into that part of your life that will change something that's going on. Second Peter 2.14 says, Having their eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls and heart they have exercised with covetous practice. Cursed children. They practiced covetous practices. But in Luke 11.28, Jesus replied, but even more blessed are all who hear the Word of God and put it into practice. Heard it and put it into practice. It's hearing and doing the Word of God. Amen? That's what puts it into practice. There are people sitting on church pews today, and I don't know if you're in here or not, but you might be, but if preaching could have done it, you would have done, had all you need. You've heard the preaching. You've read the Word. But here's the difference. It's not just words on a paper. It's instruction from God for the way we think and what we do. That's what the Word of God is. And until you put it into practice, I just want to say sometimes that there's a lot of God's Word being uh, sometimes wasted on people that have heard the gospel over and over and over and don't practice it when there's people in some of these foreign countries that if they just heard it one time, it would change their life. I, told, I heard the story of a man that uh, he was an atheist in South America and he was at this resort that was at, on the, when you look out the windows, there was a rubber tree plantation out there uh, behind him. And somebody gave him a Gideon Bible. He said, I'm an atheist, I don't need this thing. And he went and stood out on the balcony, Brother Wayne, and he ripped the pages out of that Gideon Bible and threw them over the balcony. But when he did... People down there that was getting sap and making candy out of the sap of the trees, they began to pick those up and wrap their candy in them. And they brought them to market. And one particular family had their little stand there selling candy wrapped in pages of the Bible. And people began to peel those pages open and read one page of the Word of God until they got together and started coming back to buy more candy to get more pages out of this book they'd never read. And out of that tribe started a church. They all put their pages together and got the Word of God and got a revival started in their tribe. That's how powerful the Word of God is. How dare we hear it over and over on the radio, on the TV, and in church and not do something with it. I'm talking about practicing encouragement. 
That's what the Word of God does in our life. It gives us courage. We need courage. There's plenty of, there's plenty of discouragement going on. Why do you practice? Well, <laughs> I had, when I did my head like that, I just thought about it. I had a computer teacher when I went back. I was teaching in college. The computers were coming in. They wanted all their teachers to be computer literate. And some of y'all can remember back on the uh, MS-DOS days where you had to put in a certain command just to boot up the computer and to do that. Anybody remember those days, the black screen with the green letters and all those things going on? And I had a teacher, and I listened to everything he said because he was from China. And uh, I loved the way he talked, but you had to listen carefully because, you know, and Oriental people like get their R's and L's mixed up. But I'll never forget. He says, the, the click, the click is to practice. Practice makes pelvic. And I will never forget that guy. But he always came in, you know, he had that thick black hair, and the back always stood straight up like he just got out of bed. I don't know if they don't have a comb or what, but I just always got tickled at this guy on the way he would tell us, Platix, 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 Platix makes tel- pelvic. And you know, that is the one thing I remember out of the class. Platix makes pelvic. I finally got over the big orange switch. I was so glad when they came in Windows. I never even got a computer of my own until Windows came in and got away from all that stuff. But you practice to make it perfect. You practice to make it permanent. When we get that in our heart and in our lives, Barry, do you remember when you first picked up a guitar? You remember how hard that was? You know, they would say, that you have to practice until autonomic nerves take over. Autonomic nerves, meaning things that you don't have to talk to, it just does it. You can be singing words and playing a song where your hands are on one track and your mind is on another. How much more on the Word of God? I want, I want my life on that track with God. I want my life following the things of God before I even tell it to. I want, it to, I want to encourage by habit, not just because, oh, this is a good moment. You know, I have not always practiced this. Something happened in my life that made me to start practicing this, and then whenever the Lord spoke it to me again, I thought it's time to put this into a sermon. Practice, encouragement. We had a lady in the town there. I, I've pastored in Lindale for 20 years. We had a lady in town now there that drove to another church downtown rather than go to church with us. And she was elderly and thought it would be much more convenient and it could have added to our church had she attended. But this is the most critical lady and every time somebody would ask her, why don't you come to our church? It's closer. She would say something critical about our church. Oh, I can't go there because I was there one Wednesday night and he let a little girl take the offering. Ah, That's just not done. And it was always stuff like that. Or like, for instance, she went by there and we were playing games out front, vacation Bible school. But she had those criticizing our church. And then one day, she died. Okay. And they wanted to have the funeral in our church. Because it was much more convenient. My flesh. <laughs> My flesh wanted to say, oh, why don't you just head on right downtown? This church is not worthy. But she's already dead, so there wasn't no getting that message over to her. This is the time I needed to, <clears throat> what's a good word I want to use here? Let me pray. I want the right word. Suck it up. Brother Wayne, I had a golf tournament that morning. I paid $90 to play in of one of the district golf tournaments. I'd already paid my fee to play that morning, and they're going to have a funeral for this lady in my church. And my attitude is more like, well, well, just dig a hole and stick her in it. I mean, because like, hey, we had no connection. She said ugly things about our church. She worked against our church, and now they want to have a funeral in my church. But 
I thought, you know what? I need to forget about that stuff, represent the Lord well, and be courteous to the family and do the best I can to serve them. So I called the district office and told them I could not make, I had to cancel my reservations at the motel for district council. I canceled my golf, and I stayed there, amen, to just facilitate and get the people in and out. To And then they asked our church if we would do the family dinner. We did. And every time somebody thanked me, I said, thank you for the chance to serve. Now, it started out not from my heart, but it got into my heart. That I realized that though I didn't like this situation at all, I realized that I represent God, not my feelings. I need to do everything I can to make this a pleasant experience for a family. And as I started that that day, by the end of the day, I had told everybody, thank you for the chance to serve, that it, be, it got into my heart. I began to realize that in just doing something like this, I was doing it as unto the Lord, and the Lord's the one that rewards, the Lord's the one that gets the praise for it. And so I just thought, how many more things am I not practicing and letting my own personal feelings? Or is it, nobody but me out there understands this, huh? Letting my own personal feelings dictate how I think and what I say? Or do we let the Holy Spirit dictate, let the Holy Spirit by practicing God override my flesh? Override my flesh, God. And help me to represent you well. We practice to make perfect. We practice to make it permanent. Barry, I can't pick up a guitar. The first key I learned was G, C, and D. I can't pick up a guitar hardly if my fingers go, fingers go to G without me asking. They go to G until I know what key it's in. Why? Because I practice G, C, and D so much that I just go there. I didn't ask you to do it. My arm just does it. I want the things of God to be just like that in my life. I want to practice the things of God. Practice and encourage them until I go right to it. Instead of How many know some people have practiced fault finding? Anybody know what I'm talking about? They're so good at fault finding, they go to it automatically and find something wrong with what's going on. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I'm preaching better than your amen, and I don't know what you know. My job's to preach. Your job is to amen. Amen. If you get through before I do, raise your hand and say amen. Your job is to listen. My job is to preach. Help me out here. First Samuel, in the 30th chapter, David came back to the camp and found out that his camp had been raided by the Amalekites. One line in there really got me. Where it said, they were thinking about stoning David. Now, though, he didn't do it, but they were looking at his leadership. Got them in this position. But it said David encouraged himself in the Lord. He wasn't getting any encouragement from those around him. He got his encouragement. David encouraged himself in the Lord. Can I just tell you at the first here? that you are the main one to encourage yourself. I have been around God's people a long time, and I've, how many of those people that you constantly have to encourage them? Every time they come in, if you want to hear a set, boy, you don't even ask them how they're doing. You're going to get an organ recital. And nowadays, they can go online and find out all these medical terms. They used to you used to say different things. Now, they give you the whole medical history of what all they got going on. They've trained themselves to it. They've trained to try to attract some pity their way. And they're saying, please encourage me. Please encourage me. Somebody please tell me. Somebody please encourage me. But I'm telling you, folks, we've got to encourage ourselves. You won't have to depend on everybody to encourage you if you'll begin the practice. As the Bible says in Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. I think encouragement is a thing, don't you? And so 
practicing first. I think in the morning, that's what we need to get up. And in our devotions, we need to practice, encourage ourselves in the Lord. Encourage him to read scripture, quote scripture, uh, build yourself up in the Lord. I said building up yourself on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. This should be a part and a practice of your life. It's become a part of me that I, the first thing in the morning, well, first thing's coffee. But then I have a cup of coffee with the Lord. And I thought it's so cool, you know, talking about Nehemiah. He was a, he was a king's cupbearer. So he... I could just take a little side step here and say he fixed the king's coffee for him and even tested it to make sure it wasn't poison and was just right. But that position with Nehemiah put him next to the king that facilitated the rebuilding of the temple. Are y'all with me? When you found out, the king asked one morning, says, what's got you down, Nehemiah? He said, well, the house of God's like this, but it needs to be like this. And then the king facilitated him to do it. And I thought, in the mornings, brother, I want a cup of coffee with the king. Amen. Even sometimes I don't wake up happy. Sometimes I do wake up discouraged. Sometimes I could do wake up mine. But if I have a cup of coffee with the king, he'll want to know what's going on. He'll begin to speak to me when I allow the king to talk into my heart about what's got me down. And I can encourage myself in the Lord by getting into the word of God with the king. I want to be the king's cupbearer, don't you? You know, close your eyes for a moment. This ain't going to cost you any extra. This is free. But just close your mind. Close your eyes for a moment. Don't open your mind. Close your eyes. But I want you for a, mo for a moment to imagine me 10 years old. We had lived so far out of town that I couldn't belong to a little league team because I couldn't get my, my parents. It was too hard on them to take me back and forth to practice. But then we, we were moving closer to town. We moved a little closer in, and I got right on the edge of town, and I asked them if I could sign up for Little League, and they said, okay, as long as you can get yourself to practice. So I signed up, and the man called one day, said he'd chose me on his team. And I got my little red Stingray bicycle out, and I tied my glove to the handlebars. I had been practicing out at that cemetery property for years, throwing up balls and catching it, throwing up balls and hitting it. I wanted so much to be on a Little League team and organized baseball to be on a team like that. And I was so excited that on the first day of practice, I remember riding that bike the two miles to the practice field. When I pulled up there, my feeling was this. I've been chosen to this team. I'm on this roster. I got a license to practice. Now, you can open your eyes now. But can you, for a moment, just understand the excitement? Some of these kids, it wasn't nothing to them. Their parents took them to practice their parents, all their lives. They've been through Farm League and everything. Here I was, 10 years old, and the first time... And just to say I was on that team, just to say I got a right to be here. They can't, like some of them can't say, hey, get away, kid, you bother us, you know. You know, nobody's choosing you. No, I was chosen, Brother Wayne. I had a license to be there. I was on that roster. My next step was to get on the field. I was going to have the uniform. I was going to be on the bench. My next thing was to get on the field. I had a lot of excitement about a license to practice. Can I tell you today that you're on God's team? Amen. And you've got a license, amen, to practice the things of God. And we should have even more excitement, amen, about practicing with God's team, practicing the things of God. I'm, I'm, I'm about to spit all over myself up here. I'm glad you all got a little distance. Talking about just simply practicing encouragement. Whatever you're going to do good requires practice. The things that you value most in your life when will practice be over? Well, it's a lifelong commitment and it's a love long 
commitment. How long is your commitment to Christ? How long is it going to last in your walk with Christ? I expect mine to last forever. When I was little, on some monument at the cemetery, it had John 3.16. My brother would read it to me, and I memorized it. I was four years old, and I knew John 3.16 wore my brother out saying it to me till I could because I couldn't read yet and after I learned that my words are supposed to match those there it helped me get started with my reading now 66 years later I still love John 3 16 this starts with God's love and it ends with eternal life in the middle of it we must believe but I'll tell you what I believe what you practice tells whether you believe it or not your practice will reveal. What do you practice? Because that's the requirement on us is to believe. Brother, I believe it. That caused a problem. I remember when a guy was going out of my church in uh, Lancaster, an old ministry, he's 80 something years old, and he would grab, he had a little step he had to get off of, but it kind of took him a little bit to get down that step. And I'd always made a habit of shaking his hand as I helped him down that little step right out of the front of our church. And every time he'd hold my hand till he gave me some wisdom. He just had to impart some wisdom to me. One time he said, Brother Paul, next time you preach that long, do you mind bringing me a sandwich? But another time he said something that I've never forgotten. He said, Brother Paul, I got a problem. And boys, I was holding his hand getting him down there he wouldn't go let me go till I heard what his problem was I said okay brother <laughs> what's your problem he said my problem is that the book of Mark 16th chapter says he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved but he that believeth not shall be damned I just thought for a minute you know that is a problem he said brother Paul there's a lot of people out here that don't believe. And you know, it just caused me this morning to wake up for a minute. Man, I didn't realize. There's a harvest field out there. This man was reminding me of my calling as a minister. It's to get people out of hell. They're headed there. And to get them off the road to hell and on the road to heaven and you you know as I started looking at that I thought to myself you know what I had a reservation in hell it had my name on it I was headed for hell but one day Jesus in his grace and mercy March 18th 1971 he received me as I asked him to come into my heart he came in and he changed my heart he changed my life he changed my vocabulary he changed my thinking are y'all with me this morning if you're not have you had that experience because if you've had that experience you remember what I'm talking about whenever I was an orderly at the hospital and I had to get in for shift change and I went in there looking at, at the, the other nurses in that nurse's station as we were doing the, the shift change thing talking about the patients and where they're at and what they needed I looked at everything with different eyes than I had before because I was changed I was born again amen and it's there where it starts that now that I'm a Christian I need to start practicing amen and keep on practicing how I can be effective in depopulating hell and in populating heaven. That's my practice. People practice bitterness. People practice hate. They look for something to get themselves upset. If I don't watch myself on Christian gospel radio right now, I hear people come on there saying, I got something for you today that you ought to be upset about. And they begin to tell about something that's happening. And I thought, you know what? Let me go to gospel. Let me go to praise, worship. Because I like to listen to the preachers. I like to listen to, there's about five channels that I can find on my little Nissan pickup radio. And I can get those. But I, gotta change, I got to get on a channel where they're talking, 
to me about praising the Lord, not about what, if I wasn't already upset about it, what's it going to do about it now? You say, well, Brother Paul, we need to know what's going on. What I need to do is be in prayer for this lost and dying world, and I need to be an encourager in the middle of all this that is going on. Yes, I have knowledge of all this stuff. You don't have to say, oh, Brother Paul, you're sticking your head in the ground and like an ostrich, and, and that's never been proven, but you're, you're not paying attention to, to what all's going on. Oh, I know enough about it already to make me sick, but what I know is that I'm a preacher of the gospel, and I've got to practice encouragement, not practice getting mad. I have no trouble getting mad. I can get mad on my own. I can get so mad, I start wanting to stomp and romp and slam things and hit my hand like, I can get mad on my own. I'm good at that. I've done enough of it. Anybody with me this morning, you're better at getting mad than you are at getting glad. Can I tell you, you need to change your practice this morning and find a way to get glad because when you get into the good news of the Word of God, He has made me glad. I like to work in restoration and rehabilitation and in recovery. Acts 19, 18 says, Many who were believers confessed their sinful practices. I think that's part of it. I say, God, I'm, I've been a sinner. I've had sinful practices. I can remember after they had a, they used to, like back in my day before they banned Bible studies in church and stuff like they tried to do, we had a Baptist preacher. We having a citywide crusade, but they first let him come talk to the assembly at school. So they put us all in the school auditorium and let this minister talk. And he said, now some of you guys out there think you're so tough because you got a filthy mouth. And I'm slumping down in my seat, you know. He said, there's nothing tough about it just because you got a filthy mouth. Well, that wasn't bad enough. I was experiencing what they call conviction. The Holy Spirit was convicting me of my filthy mouth. That ain't bad enough. I was a senior. And when I went out the front doors of the, church, of the auditorium, this little freshman girl, I'll never forget her name was Mona. She had on big glasses and braces. And she got right in my face. She weighed about 90 pounds soaking wet. She got right in my face and she said, when that preacher was talking about people that thought they were tough because they had a filthy mouth, she said, you're the first one I thought of. Mm, yeah. Well, it wasn't very long after that before I got rid of that filthy mouth. I met Susan, and Susan encouraged me to get saved, get really saved, and so I did. And when I got saved, it changed that filthy mouth. And so now I want to talk about the Lord. People are still trying to tell me, shut up, just the same as they did when I had a filthy mouth. But now I've got a mouth that talks about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I go to 18 cell blocks a week. Some of them are closed right now, so it fluctuates between 16 and 18 cell blocks. And I step up to them. I say, would anybody like to hear some of the word? Amen. And I pull them together two at a time. They've got a wall between them. I say, you guys come over here. I want to preach the word, and I want to pray for you to those guys. And you know what? I just want to be doing that because there's plenty of guys in there. they got 24 in this group and, and, and 30 something in these cells down at the north side jail on the other side of town, the one I work. They got plenty of in, di discouragement. They got plenty of things going on in their life. The fact that they're locked up is kind of a problem. But the fact that I want to go in there and be an encourage them. I want to know there's somebody that cares about you. You might got there might not be answering your <laughs> your calls at home. They might not be answering your letters that, because you've done this so much that they don't see what's the difference. Amen. If they want to put money on your book so you can get some commissary or whatever going on. Some people have burned every bridge they had, but I want to be the voice that goes into those men that are so uh, discouraged and in a crisis in their life. I want to go into that place and bring encouragement. Amen. There is somebody that cares about you. Sometimes I've started off by saying, listen, I want to tell you all something this morning. I want to spend the rest of my life and eternity with you. And I have people look at me. I haven't had anybody all day long look at me and say, I want to spend my life and eternity with you. And then I start to tell them about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that whosoever believeth, amen, shall not perish. 
that we'll be together in heaven. Listen, if you don't like being around those kind of people, amen, down here, you better look out because heaven's going to have people in there that were jailbirds. They did have a filthy mouth, but they got saved and they got turned around with all of their problems and they're going to be in heaven with us. And I want to see them. One time I was going up, am I going too long? Are y'all okay? Don't say anything. It's probably better you don't. I was in a mall, Parks Mall. And I, God knows when we need encouragement. Now, I want to encourage myself, but can I just blab out here and say, sometimes I don't do it like I should. And I fall into discouragement because I have not been encouraging myself. But God knows the times to send somebody. Amen. God loves us just enough. Right now, somebody needs to raise their hand and say, God, send me somebody. Come on. Come on. Right now, it's okay for you to raise your hand. God, send me somebody. They'll help me get back. They'll teach me to encourage. Amen. I, we need people in our life that'll teach. There's plenty to teach you how to gripe about everything. We got all that covered. We need people that will teach people and encourage people. Amen. And I was in that mall, and there was an escalator. I'm always uh, kind of afraid of these things. I, I stand there at the bottom, and can you see me, Justin? You can see me, can you? I'm standing at the bottom. Okay. <laughs> Those kind of things scare me. I'm not all balanced, you know. And I'm going up that thing, and there's a man standing at the top looking at me just standing there grinning at me as I come up and I'm thinking okay we're in Dallas if I was in Tyler I'd probably know there's somebody who knows me but I'm in Dallas and I don't like men smiling at me oh never mind you'll get over it as I got a little closer I recognized the last time I saw him he was in white at the board unit doing time for embezzlement. Now he's got on street clothes. I got a little closer, and I stepped off and said, Winfred, how are you doing? I hadn't seen him in about three years. He said, I want you to know, Brother Paul, I'm going home for the Lord. Hey, Amen. I wasn't just a... a I wasn't just a Christian in prison. I got saved in prison, but now I'm out here and I'm still living for the Lord. When I saw you, I just wanted to tell you that. Amen. Because you came down every week to preach to us at the prison down there. And your ministry meant a lot to me. And I just want you to know that I'm still serving the Lord. And I thought to myself, is that the way it's going to be in heaven? Listen to me. Is that the way it's going to be in heaven when we get up there? Amen. Are there going to be people waiting and saying, you encouraged me? There's some people saying, I made it in spite of you. Come on. You know, I, practice, I preach a lot to elderly people. It's not, I, now I am one, okay? It's all right. I used to think 70 was old, and I still do. But there's a lot of people... They come into church week after week and don't even let the Lord give them what they need. And that is for you to be encouraging. Not for you every time you see your kids and your grandkids to think about maybe how lost they are, but to think about how wonderful it is that God put them in your life. And they don't need your criticism. They need your encouragement. And they need you to look at them and say, I'm praying for you and I love you and I care about you because too many times some of our people in our churches have gotten so sour. You're such a sour puss. No wonder your kids and grandkids don't want what you've got. You need to get some of the joy of the Lord on your face and it takes practice to do that. It, I, mean, my age, I seem like I go to a frown or something without any help, but I want to practice an encouraging and a delightful look on my face by letting Jesus come out of me when I think about the Lord, how He saved me, how He, amen, picked me up. That's when I start thinking about Him. I can't help but smile. I can't help but talk up when I think about the Lord. But there could be a revival started in your family if our elders would just start getting a smile on their face and some spring in their step and talk about the Lord and be encouraging. Oh, you need to get saved because if you don't, you're going to go to hell. And they're thinking in their mind, oh, if I get saved, I'll be like you. Ouch, come on, get over it. 
I want to be the happiest Christian on earth. I want people to see the joy of the Lord in my life. But happiness doesn't come from happenings. It comes from the joy of the Lord. I better wrap this up. I've done said something wrong, and you'll get over it. But uh, 2 Corinthians 1.24 says this. What does it mean when we want to dominate you by telling you how to put your faith into practice? We want to work together with you so you be full of joy. For it is by your own faith that you stand firm. Whose faith? Whose faith? Have you ever had somebody knock on your door and say, for free, I'd just like to check your car out? check your tires and your oil and make sure everything's good on your car. Did people knock on your door and say, I'd like to do that for you. It don't cost you anything. I'm not trying to sell anything. I just want to. How about on your house? You know, Can I check all your plumbing and fix whatever needs to be fixed and paint whatever needs to be paint and cut out and replace that dry rot that needs to be out? Anybody come to your house and do that? I can't even hardly sit on my front porch or my back porch without looking at so many things that need to be done. But guess who's going to get to do them? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> if I don't, it ain't. Well, how's it in your spiritual life? That we've got stuff rotting on the inside of us that needs to be got, gotten out. and deliver, We need deliverance from the Lord of that rotting stuff that's going on. Stuff we've allowed in there that's bringing us down. And slowly but surely, are, are y'all with me? Well, listen, I'm talking about uh, allowing the Lord to start putting the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit in your life in place of what life is trying to put in your life. It will always call for a death, burial, and resurrection experience. Something in you is going to have to die for that new thing to come alive that God wants to do in your life. And next thing I want to tell you that how long how long do I have to do this? There is nothing wrong with a lifelong practice of encouraging. I want to encourage people on my deathbed if I'm allowed to have a deathbed. I want to say I learned something new about Jesus today. I wouldn't mind if that was my last words. When I did body work then I stepped it to being a pastor I haven't preached until I got a runny nose in a while but I'm very moved by the message that the Lord gave me this morning but I did body work I learned to body work and then I did body work and then when I became a pastor of a small church they asked me to come teach body work Learn, do, teach. And what I found out that pattern in the Bible is he passed by Peter and said, Peter, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. They learn. And then they began to do as he sent them out. And then after he went on to the cross, they began to teach. Amen. Discipleship. You will find that pattern. That's what keeps you alive. That's what keeps me going. When I can't teach somebody something about the Word of God, when I can't show them with my life and speak with my words and teach somebody, you say, Brother Paul, you might get to a rocking chair where you can barely move, but you come by. We're going to talk about Jesus. There's going to be something there that when you leave my presence, there's going to be something about the Lord that you know more, something that the Lord showed me. Because I'm telling you, folks, there is nothing wrong with a lifelong commitment of serving the Lord and people say do you really have to why wouldn't you why wouldn't you what's your alternative somebody come by and you just listen to the news and you want to tell them what you just heard on the news first thing they say is good evening this is the news that's the last good thing you hear is good evening I better wrap this up Thank you for not saying amen. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and faithfulness. And that is what 
We need to practice. And can I tell you this? If you want the fruit of the Spirit moving in your life, there's not a one of these that comes natural to the flesh. You're going to have to practice love. You're going to have to practice joy. You're going to have to practice peace. You've got to practice patience. Help me, Lord. You gotta practice kindness. You gotta practice goodness. And you gotta practice faithfulness. And I'll close with this. I've heard so many versions of this that I don't even know where it started from. There's a lot of people that'd like to claim it, but I'm just gonna tell you what it says in this old proverb. Two men dwell within my breast. One is cursed, and the other is blessed. One I love, but the other I hate that the one I feed will dominate.